Have you ever wondered what it's like to live in England as a peasant? Probably not, but I'll tell you anyway. Today I am examining the day in the life of peasants, illegitimate royals, and kings and queens. I'll tell you, these peasants are workers, but they get no respect. Peasants labored away in the fields. There, they would tend to the livestock and harvest crops. Peasants would harvest all sorts of foods, some of which included acorns, radishes, cabbages, celery, carrots, onions, lettuce, and spinach. Yes, those peasants sure were self-sufficient. Most of the products they used were for personal consumption. However, they also sold goods in the market, if they had more yields than needed. All peasants were hard workers, but not all peasants were alike. There was a hierarchy system that defined the peasant. There were two distinct types, the serfs and the freemen. The serfs were legally bound to the land they worked in. They were obligated to grow their food and labor for the landowner. The freemen, on the other hand, had no master and were sometimes ambitious smallholders who were able to generate substantial sums of money by renting a property from the lord or even owning it whole. Other notable trades workers performed are basket weaving and beekeeping. The peasants may be notorious for working out in the fields, but rest assured, they had their share of fun. Shakespeare, for example, was a prominent entertainer during the Elizabethan age. Peasants would watch shows at the playhouses, written by dramatists such as Shakespeare, Marlowe, and Decker for entertainment. Fruits and nuts were sold throughout the show for people to eat and throughout the actor if they disliked the act. These plays also had scripts people could buy to read at home. Another pastime peasants would partake in was cockpit fights. Peasants often bet on which cock they thought had the best chances of winning for amusement and to make a quick shilling. And thanks to this pastime, the government established the lottery. And now, without further ado, it's time for a reenactment of what a peasant's life would have actually looked like. Wanna to go to the festival? But if thou doesn't go, he will miss thy fair maiden, Bethany Beanbottom. <coughs> Mrs. Beansbottom, she is thy apple of one's eye.
truth be told, royal bastards, uh, I'll stick to the illegitimate, were not all documented. You were either seen or unseen by the real royals, so bear with me. I will be jumping back in time before the Renaissance period, just for a second, to around 1066, when William the Conqueror reigned as king. It was certainly not common for an illegitimate royal to become king. However, William the Conqueror was one of the few to achieve this accomplishment, a monumental moment for illegitimate royals. Finally, a king who lives up to his name, a bastard. William was an only child, so the title was passed to the eight-year-old boy. This tells us that illegitimate royals could still become rulers if they were next in line. And every English monarch since William's reign is a descendant of his. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, the illegitimate royals had their wins, but not all became kings and queens. Okay, now back to the Renaissance period. Most illegitimate royals would either become dukes, such as Henry VIII's son, Duke of Richmond, Henry Fitzroy, or commoners that were paid with hush money, or ignored completely. James Scott was an illegitimate son of King Charles II and the Duke of Monmouth. King Charles attempted to deter Monmouth's ambitions by banishing him, but his unauthorized return caused him to align with the opposition Whigs. Thus, they elevated his status by promoting him as the Protestant Duke. As mentioned before, Henry Fitzroy was an illegitimate child of King Henry VIII. King Henry made Henry a Duke of Richmond. Fitzroy relished his prince-like lifestyle up until his death at the age of 17. Anyway, although Henry Fitzroy was the only illegitimate Henry VIII acknowledged, in the 1520s, rumor about Henry having other illegitimate children arose. Save for the case of Henry Fitzroy, Henry Tudor never acknowledged his unauthorized kids. One of these kids, Catherine Carey, was born at the time Henry had an affair with her mother, Mary. It seems that the lifestyle differed for royal bastards. If the king accepted you as his own, then you would have a joyous, pampered life. But if you were not acknowledged by the king, you most likely would be treated as a commoner. Dukes were in charge of overseeing their lands and estates and acting as military commanders when needed. They played a part in the nation's governance by functioning as the monarchs and the House of Lords advisors. Which brings us to a very short video of how an illegitimate royal may have lived their life. I gotta get help. Woo! It's a good thing I got help. I would have lost my bread maker. Hmm. Well, that duke's life seemed eventful. Well, like I mentioned before, if the king saw you as his own, you would have had a prince-like lifestyle. Uh, if you want to know how an unseen royal's life would have looked like, imagine that peasant fellow from the last story as an orphaned illegitimate. I think we all know what royalty looks like, but what about how it feels? 
The main job of a king or queen is to rule over the land and make benefiting choices for the people. Kings are in charge of creating laws as well as enforcing them. If someone didn't follow the rules, the king would be the one to determine their punishment. Queens would act as regents when the king was sick. Kings may have lived in highly protected castles, but they also fought in wars. A king would risk his life while leading his army to victory. The king's feasts would leave no one full. There were at least 20 various meat dishes for the king and his friends to enjoy. Royals would have free time as well. In fact, Queen Elizabeth was known to be a social butterfly. Yes, she was a master in public relations. A thousand torchbearers would have lit up her cavalcade if it were late at night. Her favorite place to go was the castle in Greenwich with friends. Even Henry had fun. Some say Henry VIII would watch cockpit fights due to a found document of a man portraying his features at a cockpit fight. As the day comes close to an end and the final video comes neareth, I will end on these final notes. Henry VIII was a known sportsman, musician, and collector. He even composed his own pieces, such as Pastime with Good Company. The final video will express what that might have looked like. I hope you enjoy it. The sun rises and shines light into the king's chambers. He wakes and stretches before making his way over to the fireplace to signal to his servants he's ready to start his day. Starting as he normally does around 7 in the morning, the servants dutifully respond and greet his grace by arriving at his door, approximately dressed no later than 8 in the morning. As the esquires for the body are not allowed to enter the pallet chamber, they must remain at the door along with the pages and will fetch and carry their clothing upon request. The servants will also assist in preparing their clothing both in the evening and in the morning. Per the king's decree, the six gentlemen of the privy chamber must be present in his room by seven in the morning or earlier, depending on his majesty's decision the night before. His grace shall be dressed in a manner showcasing respectful, discreet, and sober fashion for his preference when he emerges from his chamber to start the day. What in the hell?